Ladies and gentlemen, kicking off the first stop on his world tour, our new president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson! You say you want some revelation, well here you go. It's gonna blow your freaking mind. Greetings, brothers and sisters. Welcome to the weekly Mormon News Roundup. I'm your humble host, Steve Ace, and that's Talent on Loan from Kolob. Every week, my crew and I, we ruminate on the great and spacious beehives. So thanks so much for joining us to discuss the contemporary events in Mormonism. Today is March 31st, 2024. The Church's Humanitarian Report has just been released, and we're going to give you a deep dive into what it is trying to tell us. David Archuleta has officially joined the ex-Mormon community and Twitter and the entire blogger knackle is in an uproar. And finally, the new Lone Mountain Temple in Las Vegas, Nevada is causing a lot of controversy. You're not gonna wanna miss this episode. If you wanna get in touch with me, send me an email to colab at mormonnewsroundup.org or you can visit my website at www.mormonnewsroundup.org. I'd like to welcome one of my program, my fabulous co-host, John Lunwell. John, how's it going? Hi, Dives, it's going great. It's good to be on your show. It's fantastic. I am really looking forward to this. Now, uh, John, who are you and what are you all about? I'm an Exmo. I uh, got my undergrad at uh, BYU Provo in English Lit and uh, my graduate degree in Comparative Myth and Religious Studies from the Joseph Campbell School out of California. I teach there. I'm a project manager of the Utah Cultural Astronomy Project, a small group of researchers go out into the deserts of Utah and surrounding states uh, recording and surveying uh, mostly ancient Fremont sites. I have three wonderful kids. Here I am. Well, it is a pleasure to have you on the program. I was made aware of you from the Mormonish podcast, which is perhaps where the rest of us kind of got to know you. And we're going to talk a little bit more about those episodes at the end of the podcast, but we're really glad to have you on. And we're going to just jump right into the news this week because there's a lot of things happening from the fallout from last week. Sister Dennis, the second counselor in the General Relief Society president, made a remarkable claim that we are still feeling the ramifications of, and it's an LDS women's leader whose priesthood speech ignite an Instagram debate. And there was a quite a bit of response that went to this. She said that no other religious organization that she's aware of gives such power and authority to women in the church. And we're still feeling the reverberations from Sister Dennis's take last week at the 182nd Relief Society, I believe it was 182nd Relief Society conference. What are your initial thoughts on Sister Dennis since you weren't on last week? Were you following that? And what are your thoughts about LDS women and the priesthood? I was in the Yucatan last week, so I'm catching up on all the news stories. But this story sh certainly shows the interesting psychology in Mormonism. Uh, look, we all know that Mormonism is a deeply patriarchal and traditionally misogynistic Protestant fundamentalist faith. Don't be angry at me for saying it. The, it's the Mormon brethren did that to the religion, not me. So sure enough, she's uh, bringing out a trope that because women have the Relief Society and participate in priesthood ordinances that they share in the power and authority of the church, which most women understand this certainly is not true. And, and it all comes down into definitions. I have, you know, I don't know what what she's thinking, but clearly the response from thousands of LDS women, active and ex, uh, show that this definitely hit a nerve because... It's just simply not true. Yeah, it certainly went viral, and we're still feeling the ramifications from the fallout of Sister Dennis's controversial remarks regarding the role of women in the LDS Church. And I was looking forward to this week, John, of taking a look at some of the other podcasts out there and see how they would handle it, because we at the Mormon News Roundup last week, we did a deep dive into her comments, spent almost a half an hour on it, and I was interested to see how other LDS-themed podcasts would handle the controversy. And my first uh, thoughts were, hey, let's Let's go over to Thoughtful Faith, but guess what happened here, John? Jacob Hansen over there, who literally releases a video all the time, he didn't want to touch this one with a 10-foot pole. He made no response to it. He made sure to talk about David Archuleta, but women in the church, he's not going to tackle that one so much for the Thoughtful Faith. And also, another one out there, there's, there's a bunch of these, Christian Homestead with almost 30,000 subscribers. He releases a video every single day, and these get tens of thousands of views. And once again, 
he didn't talk about the controversy either. And John, Saints Unscripted, one of the biggest platforms out there, 80,000 subscribers. These are all juggernauts in the LDS podcasting community. They release videos almost every day. You can see yesterday, the day before, three days before, eight days before. All of these podcasts, John, are uh, covering LDS news. And they're supposed to be contemporary watching events where we can talk about Mormon culture. And guess what? None of those podcasts, nor a bunch of others, including Let's Get Real, including Scripture Central, including the church's newsroom, none of these platforms want to even cover this particular issue. And I'm just wondering, why is the blogger knuckle so silent out there on Sister Dennis's remarks? You know, that really is remarkable. It's one thing for ex-Mormons to criticize it. But really, the ball is in the court of the faithful LDS. And these podcasters should be addressing it. They should take it head on. And they should admit the faults of the church, and they should um, invite the church to step forward in a better way. That is the mature and the spiritual thing to do, let alone the intellectually honest thing to do. So you know, just uh, how about a polite nudge? Hey, guys, let's show up, show up and do the work. Now, a couple of podcasts did take a look at it, and that was Greg from Quick Media. He did do a podcast on it, but it was one of his least viewed podcasts on his entire channel. If you look at all of his videos, he typically gets 15, 20,000 views on all of his podcasts. But the one that he did on feminism and power and role of women in the church, where he brought on a church apologist who works for the Deseret News, received very few views. And uh, I just want to show one other podcast that took a look at Sister Dennis's controversial remarks, and it's from Ward Radio. I just want to play a quick clip here, John, because I think this is one of the only responses that I could find out there of anyone wanting to talk about this issue. So let's see what those guys at Ward Radio are saying about real LDS women reacting to Relief Society protests and critics. A lot of people asking for a response from this. Uh, says, yes, priesthood power is given to the women of the LDS church through setting apart for callings and through the endowment, but it's only granted through men by men. Men decide the callings. Men must sign your temple recommend. Men perform the endowment with the exception of Washington anointing. Until we recognize equality of heavenly parents, we will not have equality in the organization of the church or in our families. Say her name. Say her name. Dang it. Oh, boy. Kidding. But also, okay, I just had this thought. <laughs> it seriously annoys me. Like, why can't women, why can't we believe that we are powerful like why do we why are these women going into the comments saying validate me like i want to be powerful like girl own up and be powerful like you don't need a man to tell you okay here you go here's some power to feel powerful like what are these women doing freaking be own up and be powerful yourself John, she says that the women who were reacting to Sister Dennis's speech were just seeking validation and were basically being whiners. Is that your feeling from following this particular issue? Let me just read uh, Sister Annette Dennis's. She she released a little clip responding to all the comments. And in it, she writes, quote, as a member of the General Relief Society presidency, I can assure you that we and our church leaders are listening and learning from the things you have shared with us. Please know we hear you, we need you, and we care, end quote. Well, who is we? And she re immediately refers to the church leaders. The comment there was that we are dispossessed from actually fully participating, and the response that S Sister Dennis uh, gives is, uh, the church leaders are listening, right? So even she is deferring to the brethren in responding to these comments. So it's so deeply ingrained. It is a completely top-down patriarchal order, patriarchal church. So the other comment I have to the good sister on Ward Radio, make, you know, just show up and be empowered. Just be you, be empowered. I'm glad she's saying that, but I, she may not be aware that 20 years ago, if his sister showed up and self-empowered, she would be disciplined in the bishop's office. <laughs> you don't even have to show up and say, I want the priesthood. You could just show up and say, hey, bishop, th this is wrong. We should do it ABC for CDE reasons. Please listen. The, the response is, sisters, don't talk. You know, this is Brother Packer. Don't talk. Put on your lipstick and uh, just nudge the brethren along and, and be quiet. 
there's that response, but literally I, for most of the church, there was zero empowerment for women and, and worse than that. I would suggest the sisters show up and show power, uh, show priesthood power, because, uh, you know, in Joseph Smith never mentioned uh, the priesthood before 1834. He never mentioned Peter, James, and John. He never mentioned John the Baptist. There was no mention of the transfer of the keys in the earliest uh, production of the Book of Commandments, Doctrine and Covenants. All of that was backdated. In short, he just showed up and invented the power. Why don't you do the same? <laughs> you have equal priesthood authority and more moral authority. If you just show up and say, you know what? We, we had a revelation. We're backdating the documents. We're now in charge. <laughs> Those are all very good points. I'll just make a couple of other points. First of all, we have zero Quorum of the 15 engagement on what was a social media firestorm. Taking leadership in an organization means that you have accountability for what people say. Sister Dennis's comments were presumably approved through correlation and approved as President Nelson was presiding over the meeting. Where is the quorum of the 15 engagement on this issue? They are completely AWOL. Speaking of who else is AWOL, Aaron Sherinian, the PR man who was recently hired back in January from the Deseret Management Corporation, he has also not weighed in on this issue. There's a number of AWOL people out there. And in fact, as I mentioned, a number of other podcasts, they will not cover this issue with a 10-foot pole because either they don't care about LDS women's concerns or they have no answers to the reasonable objections that people gave to her outlandish comments. John, it only took her four days to respond to these comments, four days. And believe it or not, for the church, I guess that's considered a quick response. But for people who really care about PR, about care about connecting with people, who care about ministering to others and alleviating concerns, four days is woefully inadequate. And basically, my sum up here from Sister Dennis is basically, she said, sorry, ladies, I, I don't have any more institutional power than you do. So all I'm going to be able to do is offer meaningless, useless platitudes. That's the basic sum up that I get from Sister Dennis. And also what you mentioned earlier, one other point. She said in the statement that we and our church leaders will take a look at it. This is an explicit admission on her part that she's not part of the church leadership. If the General Relief Society presidency is not part of church leadership, then really there is no power and authority in this church for women because literally the second highest ranking woman says that she's going to bring her concerns to church leaders. She doesn't even include herself as a church leader. This is just really, really sad, honestly. The Christian message is the truth will set you free. All you have to do is tell the truth. One day, the, the brethren of the church will learn this, but they haven't. If she come out and said, women in this church have not been empowered, and we are going to change that, that would be truth. But instead, she comes out and says, there is no other church that empowers their women more than us. <laughs> that is, you know, farce. Yeah, that's objectively not a reasonable position to take. And I just want to address what Brittany Ellis said. That was the woman in the word radio. She said women should just act powerful. And I know this isn't a perfect analogy. And I'm not saying that these are morally equivalent. But if you think about the Jim Crow laws, which disenfranchised people systemically in the South, it wasn't that black people could just say, well, act powerful. When a system of oppression is on you, that strips you of your uh, power and ability to act for yourself, it's not enough just to pretend that you have power because that will be squelched immediately. It's a systemic issue. It's not about pretending that you have power. It's about changing the system to be much more equitable. And I'm not saying that slavery and women in the church are the same thing. It's just an analogy. You can't act powerful if you have no power. It'd be different if you said, look, look, I live in the outskirts of D.C. And let's say that women's issues were mostly being represented by men in the political sphere here in D.C. Well, you could tell women, go ahead and run for the city council, run for the school board. Go ahead and get yourself onto the uh, planning commissions. Go ahead and run for Senate. Go ahead and run for office. And then you can bring the power to the situation and bring women's issues to the forefront. That'd be different. The problem is that women in the church have no ability to do that. They have no ability to access any of the decision-making of the final say in the church. 
So you can't just say act powerful when you have no ability to have any power. Any last thoughts on Sister Dennis and um, the fallout from last week here, John? No, Adives, that was a very good point you just made. Absolutely. Now, let me just give one more uh, slide. We'll leave this on a slightly humorous tone here. The Mormon Onion, which is one of my favorites here. General authorities are glad the members are talking about good old cultural issues like women in the priesthood instead of embarrassing SEC sanction penalties. Yeah, <laughs> that pretty much sums it up for me. I think the church is actually, I know this is a, I know this is a serious issue here, but uh, I do have to, I do like the Mormon onion from time to time. Leave us a thought here. We're on Apple Podcasts. We're also on YouTube. Leave us a thought on what you think about Sister Dennis and the fact that so many of the other LVS Themes podcasts won't talk about this issue at all. It's really one of the biggest Achilles heels in the entire church. I think it is a bigger issue than LGBTQ. It's a bigger issue than the SEC fine. It's one of the defining issues of this generation and of President Nelson's ministry and his leadership in the church. And so far, what we've seen is the church doing absolutely nothing on this issue of any substance whatsoever. Now, we're going to transition over to the church has released its humanitarian report this year, John. How much did the LDS church spend on humanitarian aid last year. And this is from Feeding the Hungry to Helping to Shelter Refugees. The Utah-based faith is upping its charitable spending as it faces pressure to do more good with its massive wealth. John, it looks like the church has given out a lot more money this year than it had in times past, up to $1.3 billion. Is this a win for the church? This story is an echo a mirror image of the last story. The church just cannot be truthful. It's so sad. So yeah, it, it's uh, according to the church. This is church self-reporting numbers, 1.3 billion. The majority of that is fast offerings. That's members giving their money to other members and the church manages that. So uh, the church in financial aid, cash aid to charitable causes, it gave about $300 million in 2023 according to the widow's might report which is double what it was in 2022 which was double what it was in 2021 look what happened ever since the whistleblower came out and said the church is spending no money on charitable causes in, in context to the 100 200 billion dollar uh, nest egg it has grown the church through being exposed is starting to spend more money boy would, where were you before the whistleblower? That whistleblower, there's your prophet of God. Everyone else sitting in that church office building, they're accountants. Let's take a look at a video that I put together that talks about the church's humanitarian efforts in 2023 and what I consider to be the wins for the church and also things that we should be very skeptical about. Let me play this for you and get your reaction to this two minute video. Ever wondered how much the LDS church spends on charity? Hold your breath for the number is quite large. In 2023, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints reported a whopping $1.3 billion in charitable aid. This marked the second year in a row that the church has exceeded the billion-dollar threshold. The aid has a global reach, extending a helping hand to both members and non-members alike. The LDS Church has been actively involved in a broad spectrum of initiatives, from welfare and self-reliance assistance to humanitarian relief projects. The church has also forged partnerships to tackle pressing issues such as health care, food insecurity, emergency relief, clean water, and maternal health care. Furthermore, the church's benevolence extends to refugees, immigrants, and those affected by natural disasters, while also emphasizing environmental stewardship and community service. With such a vast reach, the LDS Church is undoubtedly making an impact. But is it as significant as it seems? Let's shift our focus now to the LDS Church's total wealth. Brace yourself for this one. The LDS Church is reportedly sitting on a wealth of $265 billion. Yes, billion with a B. This staggering sum far outstrips the church's charitable spending. It's like comparing a drop of water to an entire ocean. Now it's important to remember that without external auditing, we're essentially taking the church's word on these figures. While we're not implying any sort of dishonesty, it's simply a good practice to approach such claims with a healthy dose of skepticism. Verification and transparency are key in such matters, especially when the numbers are this astronomical. So while the church's charitable spending is impressive, it is but a drop in the ocean of its total wealth. Now that we've unpacked the numbers, let's take a step back and reflect. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the year 2023 
provided over a billion dollars in charitable aid. This is impressive and noteworthy indeed. Yet when we juxtapose this figure against the church's estimated wealth of $265 billion, the context shifts. The humanitarian contributions, while substantial, represent only a small fraction of the church's immense wealth. This is not to diminish the church's efforts, but rather to create a broader perspective. We must also remember that without an external audit, we're essentially taking the church's word on these figures. Critical thinking becomes our ally here. It encourages us to question, to seek verification, and to understand the deeper implications of these numbers. It's not just about how much is given, but also about how much more could be potentially done. The LDS Church's charitable spending and wealth are both significant. But as always, it's essential to look beyond the numbers and understand the bigger picture. So first of all, John, I like to be as fair as I can in my reporting or coverage of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. How did I do on that video? And what about the issues that the video brought up? Namely, that the church has given a billion dollars or a little bit more than that, allegedly, according to church internal reporting to charity. But at the same time, the church is worth a valuation of $265 billion. What do you think of the video? And what about the church's overall picture here? Uh, opacity breeds corruption so the church needs transparency and the gospel topic essays show that when the church was able to control the entire narrative to be as opaque as it wanted to be it lied it lied about every essential historical and doctrinal issue they could lie about in order to paint themselves well if they've done that with the doctrine if they've done that with the history do you think they're doing that with their finances well, of course they are. The best point of that video is there's no external audits. They are completely insular. They are completely hidden. You know, so what's the purpose of the church? They claim they are the kingdom of God. So what is the kingdom supposed to do with its financial resources? For every dollar they spend in global aid, they spend $100 in investments. So is that the vision of the kingdom of God? Yeah, you talked about the church's gospel topics essays, which the church has released over the years. And the last gospel topics essay, John, is the one that is on church finances, which the church released after the whistleblower, David Nielsen, brought his allegations that the church was operating a clandestine hedge fund for almost 25 years. And this church finances gospel topics essays. I'm not sure if you've read it, but this is one of the most joke of an essay that you've ever read. It doesn't tell you anything about why the church has done what it does. Why has it um, withheld its information? Why did it break the law for decades in concealing its wealth? This is one of the most poorly written gospel topics essays that I'm aware of. Now, John, you also mentioned the widow's might report, which is the gold standard of keeping the church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints accountable. And this is the basic snapshot that they released this last week. There's a bunch of slides, but we're just going to give you the most important one because we don't necessarily do huge deep dives. But basically, you see the church's humanitarian giving has increased 5x in the last couple of years. From 2021, it was 900 million. 2022, it was 1 billion. In 2023, it was almost $1.4 billion. And it talks about the how the humanitarian aid in particular, the cash donations have significantly increased into this last year of almost 500 million million dollars. So as you mentioned, John, the fast offering, which is this area in blue, has remained somewhat constant at a range of approximately $700 million per year. Now, the fast offering is generally kept at the local level, and it is not faith blind, meaning you give money to your bishop or to your branch president, and that money is immediately turned around and given to someone else at the local congregation who is in need. Now, these other cash donations are generally faith blind donations. So we have seen a significant increase in what the widows might re report is telling us about church donations. And as you mentioned, John, there is, it can't be a coincidence that now that the widows might report and David Nielsen's allegations have been brought to light and have been basically verified by 60 minutes that the church is now engaged in increased giving. Those two things, I can't prove a causation, but I can definitely prove a correlation. You know, technically you're right, but it is a causation. The church would not be doing what they're doing now without uh, the whistleblower and without transparency. Someone looked at it. They shine sunlight on the issue and the church said, oh, crap, they're, they're finding out what we're doing. Well, guess what? We haven't even scratched the surface. I bet if we opened the books of the church and saw what they were really doing, the uh, the first people 
to leave the church would be the most ardent TBM Mormons. Because, you know, when it comes to money, th this is <laughs> where the rubber hits the road. I don't need to know any other fact other than the church keeps everything hidden from their members. Uh, in fact, when the uh, church released their numbers in 2023, it came with a uh, message from the first presidency. Do you mind if I read it? Certainly. Go ahead. Yeah. Quote, as followers of Jesus Christ, we consider this, or the donations, to be both a duty and a joyful privilege. Church President Russell M. Nelson and his counselors, Dallin H. Oak and Henry B. Eyring, in the governing first presidency said in a joint statement, quote, we gratefully acknowledge the selfless contributions of time and means from church members, friends, and other trusted organizations that enable this work to progress and expand, end quote. There they are. As followers of Christ, we are going to give our 300 or 400 or 500 million dollars. This makes us Christian. <laughs> no, the money is almost irrelevant. What makes you Christian is truth. What makes you Christian is conscience. What makes you Christian is transparency, is virtue, is repentance. Coming out and saying, for now on, we're having an external audit and we're revealing our numbers to the membership of the church who provide the sustenance for the church. That makes you Christian. This is chameleon Christianity. Yeah, as you mentioned, John, the most important thing about this entire humanitarian report is the lack of an external audit, meaning an external agency is not coming into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to lay open the books and then provide a transparent report to the rest of us. This is the type of thing that a Red Cross engages in, that most Catholic dioceses engage in, that the Community of Christ engages in, that any nonprofit or charity that is worth its lick in salt will engage in external auditing. And why do they do that? It's so that people who make donations can have confidence that their donation is either not being squandered or mismanaged or is being used for any nefarious purposes. I'm not making an allegation here that the church is engaged in those practices, but without the external audit, we have no confidence in what is happening with those donations. So if you look back to this slide here, the fast offering assistance, which is around seven to $800 million per year. John, is there any possible way for me or you or even an investigative reporter or anyone out there to verify that indeed the church has taken in the fast offering and has 100% passed it through like it has claimed for years to its own members. Is there any way to verify this? No. No, there's not. There's absolutely no way. You can talk to some members and get some anecdotes, but you can also get anecdotes from members who said that they went to their bishop and didn't get any help. There's no way to know that, that is the case. If you look at the goods donated, now, the church does make some goods donations that we can verify. If they give a big donation of uh, food or other services to a big organization, we can verify some of that. But we can't verify all of the goods that the church is claiming to donate. And finally, we have cash donations. Now, many of the cash donations, whether it's the $7 million that the church gave to the Red Cross this week or the $44 million to the World Food Program last year or some of the other checks that the church writes to mostly nonprofit organizations that it partners with, we can verify that by calling up that nonprofit and realizing that, yes, indeed, the church did write those checks. OK, but the problem here is that we've come to find out in the last couple of years that sometimes those donations are brought back to the church and are returned and are not actually used for its intended purposes. So even the things that we can check on this humanitarian report, which is the church cash giving, some of that is still not 100% verifiable because it could potentially be returned. So what I'm trying to tell you is in the sum up here of the $1.4 billion that we have here from the church, we can't verify any of the fast offering. We can verify very little of the goods donated. We don't know what goes out of the Bishop's storehouse. We don't know what goes out of Welfare Square. We don't know what goes out of the DI. This is all self-reported, and only a small portion of the cash donations can we verify. So we have to take the church's word for this $1.4 billion. And call me a skeptic here, John, if I am not willing to take the church's word on their $1.4 billion given the SEC fine, and as you mentioned, the church's history of promoting a faith-promoting narrative, which is slightly, or shall we say, seriously disingenuous. I agree. Transparency is the only thing that's going to cure this, and uh, they won't do it on their own. Transparency has to be imposed upon them. 
yeah, you're going to need to rise up from the members. And as you see full-time tithe payers who say, you know what, I'm not going to donate to the church, kind of like Jana Reese, who we had on the podcast, unless the church proves that it's doing something good with my donation, instead of just enriching Wall Street stockholders of Tesla, Microsoft, and Apple, unless the church is externally audited and I have confidence that my meager donation is being uh, used to alleviate the human suffering on this planet, I'm not going to continue to donate to the church. And I really had a couple of people who kind of pushed back on me on this. For instance, uh, Jonah from Ward Radio came into my comment section on YouTube and he says, well, show me the Lamborghini, show me the mismanagement, show me where the church leaders have personally enriched themselves. I'm not making that claim. The burden of proof here is on the church. The church is making a claim that it is donating $1.4 billion to humanitarian purposes on this earth. I am asking the church or I am seeking for the church to verify that claim. The burden of proof is not on me as a skeptic of that claim. The burden of proof is on the church. And so far, they have provided almost no evidence to any humanitarian giving whatsoever. We have to take the church's word for virtually all of its humanitarian donations. And I am not willing to do that. And I posture, John, that no reasonable person considering the church's history of obfuscation of its finances and of its illegal dealings, especially in light of the SEC fine, no reasonable person should trust an organization like this to do good with their donation, especially considering David Nielsen saying that the church did almost nothing humanitarian wise for 22 years through Ensign Peak, except for building a mall and bailing out an insurance. People who pay tithing to the church deserve the transparency. And right now the church is not giving that to them. Let me give you the last word on the humanitarian report and church transparency in general. Two things. Uh, show me the Lamborghini. Uh, the church spends an enormous amount of money on that uh, bishop's hotline. The whole purpose of that hotline is to spend money on not spending money on the victims that are created in the church. That's the world, but it's certainly a grotesque misuse of funds for the kingdom. Uh, point two, I watched a really disturbing podcast on Mormonism Live last week. I don't know if you caught that, but I forget the professor's name. They, they were showing a, another podcast of a BYU economics professor. He teaches ethics in economics and he was talking about uh the sec fine and half of what he said was just pure blatantly false it literally was chilling because he was blaming the sec fine on the lawyers of the church who were mismanaging the brethren of the church even though the sec fine made it very clear that it was the other way around it was the leaders of the church that were directing the lawyers of the church to create the shell companies. And he knows that he knows that. And he just blatantly misrepresented that. And here is your professor of economics and ethics at BYU doing this. So you say, can we trust the church? No, no. The corruption is embedded into the ethical paradigm. They live by this idea that the church is the kingdom, and that makes it the leading moral imperative. All other moral imperatives are subsidiary. Therefore, as long as it serves the church, it is a greater cause, which means they'll never repent unless they're made to repent. And sadly, that's where we're at. Yeah, I did watch that podcast. It was with BYU professor Aaron Miller, who has made the rounds on a number of different podcasts attempting to defend the church's finances, which for me is a tall order. As I've mentioned in my YouTube comments many times, wise investment of any organization is a good idea. You know, the church has an operating expense of somewhere around $67 billion per year. Uh, a wise investment would be, you know, five years of operating expenses would be perfectly reasonable. The church right now has an overall valuation, according to the Widow's Might Report, of $265 billion. So it is far in excess of what any reasonable organization should have. So the shameful hoarding of $300 billion is morally reprehensible. Wise investment, that is to be uh, commended. I mean, people want to draw a parallel in my comment section say look at the u.s government it's almost in bankruptcy and it's billions of dollars in debt the church is really smart no it's smart to have a a, a wise nest egg and then use it to help other people it's shameful to hoard 300 billion dollars that's the difference now as you mentioned john earlier that the church um what it does actually with the donations that are brought in a large portion of that is actually used not for alleviating human suffering but actually in, in buying real estate, farms, ranches, hunting preserves, you name it, the church is the number one holder 
of real estate in the United States by valuation and is probably either number one or number two by acres owned. And this article here just came out of GulfLive.com that talked about how the church has become Florida's largest private land owner with hundreds of thousands or even millions of acres uh, throughout Florida. This particular article says that there's 700,000 acres. It very well might be more than that because the church, it likes to obscure how it accumulates research by using a lot of different uh, of its LLCs and different corporations that are part of its real estate arm. So it very well might be more. And I was doing a little bit of research for this two minute video because I thought, John, that the, the way that the church gained so much land in Florida was from wealthy Mormons dying and leaving their estates to LDS philanthropies. And I came to find out that I was wrong about my assumptions. So let me play this video and get your reaction to how much the church owns in Florida. It's absolutely stunning. Did you know which is the largest landowner in Florida? It's not a big corporation or a wealthy individual. It's the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, more commonly known as the Mormon Church. This religious organization has quietly amassed 678,000 acres of land, valued at nearly $16 billion across the United States. However, the story of how this came to be is one that stretches back over several decades and is as much about mission and vision as it is about real estate. The year was 1947, when the church made its first significant land acquisition in Florida. This marked the establishment of the Deseret Ranch, a move that signified a shift towards self-sufficiency and resilience. The church's focus on real estate investments, particularly in farmland, ranches and timberlands, was not just a financial decision, but a strategic one that aligned with its mission of providing for its members and creating a sustainable food reservoir. Over the years, the church broadened its real estate portfolio, making significant acquisitions in Florida, one of these was a recent purchase of warehouses in Miami-Dade County. These acquisitions reflect the church's commitment to long-term planning and economic self-reliance. Today, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is not just a religious organization, but also a major player in the real estate sector. With over 17 million members worldwide, including 6.7 million in the US and 168,000 in Florida, the church continues to expand its real estate holdings to support its mission and community. In recap, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has become the largest landowner in Florida through a combination of strategic planning, a commitment to self-sufficiency, and a mission-driven approach to real estate. The story of its rise to this position is a testament to the power of long-term thinking and the potential of mission-aligned investments. So next time you think about the largest landowners in Florida, remember the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All the land the church had in Florida was for, you know, agricultural use and uh, to build the welfare uh, estate of the church. But as the article points out, they want to build a city, neighborhoods, uh, capitalize on real estate investments. It's the same old thing. And without transparency, they'll do what they want to do and they'll make money doing it. Only a small portion of the land that is being used in Florida is being used to grow food that is given away. The vast majority of what the church is doing in Florida and throughout the United States and the world is for commercial ventures. They're raising cattle to sell them at a profit. They're raising citrus or other crops to sell at a profit. Only a small portion of it goes to the bishop's storehouse to begin with, because a lot of these bishop's storehouses are actually sourced by just the regular commercial grocery stores to begin with, not from church internal sourcing. And as the article also points out, it's the church's priorities when it comes to what it spends its money on. We just talked about the humanitarian report and the church spending, well, $500 million in the entirety of last year. Well, just in this this one article, the church bought a $174 million industrial property near Miami, and that was just one purchase out of many of its real estate purchases throughout the year. So the church became a juggernaut in Florida by slowly accumulating these ranches that were out of the way at only pennies on the acre. They were really, really cheap, and then they developed them using not only church service by senior missionaries who are going here uh, devoting time and labor, giving years of free labor to the church on these ranches in order to build them up and develop them. 
And then the church continuously expanding that pie by using the donations that are brought in, not for building up the kingdom of God, as it were, or for salvation or anything like that, but for really uh, just becoming a real estate juggernaut. That's why, John, that in that video, I use the most epic music that I could find because the church's real estate portfolio is truly epic. Well, look, if they're using missionaries and paying them zero, so they're volunteering their time to run the ranches, run the farms, right? And then the majority of that goes to commercial profits. This is deeply troubling. It's deeply problematic. Uh, and again, they need transparency. The books need to be opened. And then people can decide whether they want to serve that service mission so that the church can go to market and, you know, make their money at, in that way. Yeah, at the Deseret Ranches in Florida, there are a number of people who are there as paid part of the church. They need the expertise that comes from real cowboys, real ranchers, real agriculturalists, real people who know this industry very well. But there's also a large number of service missionaries, my understanding. And don't forget, they're not just volunteering, John. Typical senior service missionaries, they actually pay yeah. the church to be there. You know, and that payment is actually a lot more than the regular proselytizing missionaries, which I believe is four or five hundred dollars a month. Those senior church missionaries can be paying up to two thousand dollars a month to work in very austere conditions. These are typically your grandmas and grandmas, really faithful, good people, great Mormons who are 60, 70 years old, and they're out toiling or working on these uh lands in very austere conditions. There's been a number of anecdotes over the years that have shown that people who go on these service missions, they don't know what they're getting into. But once they're there, it's like, well, I can't turn my back on the Lord. I have to finish out. And it's a really, really tough situation. But if you want to become a real estate juggernaut, if you want to become the number one holder of real estate in the world, it's these type of practices which help you get there. And don't forget that the church oftentimes buys these properties in a waste to avoid paying property taxes. Now, I don't know if the church is paying property taxes exactly on desert ranches. I don't know the exact ins and outs, but we know from times past that they engineer the, 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 the sale of these properties, either from their not-for-profit entities or in some way as to avoid paying the maximum amount of taxes. And it spreads the rest of the tax burden out across the people who live in that Florida area. So, I mean, the church, it's fascinating how the church does all of this. Any last thoughts? on the church real estate and on this Florida article here, John? It's the same issue we keep running into of denial, lack of transparency. It's funny that you say lack of transparency because that does go into our next article as well, which talks about church attendance numbers. Now, this was brought out by the Deseret News and also covered by the Salt Lake Tribune. They always seem to have dueling articles on these things. It's kind of amusing to watch. But Latter-day Saints lead the way in church attendance numbers, according to the church itself. Once again, self-reported. But the numbers may not reflect the reality. So there's a couple of different tables that uh, come across from this particular article. And this is the frequency of U.S religious service attendance by religion from 2021 to 2023. How often do you usually attend church, synagogue, mosque, or temple? And when you query this particular list here that has Latter-day Saints, a Muslim, Catholic, Judaism, Orthodox, Buddhism, Hinduism, you will see that Latter-day Saints are the tip of the top. 54% of Mormons attend church weekly according to their own self-reported information, which is top among the list. The only problem here, John, is when you dial down into the numbers, <laughs> like the cell phone data that was recently released, a new report that used cell phone data harvested from 2.1 million Americans from April 2019 to the pre-pandemic month of February 2020 indicates that the true percentage of Latter-day Saints who attend church regularly might be as close as 15%, <laughs> a job bruising 52 percentage points lower than the number who reported doing so to Gallup just one or two years earlier. So once again, because the church does not release its transparent numbers, we're left to pull the pieces together. And what Latter-day Saints tell pollsters seems to be in diametric opposition to what they actually do in their own worship practices. Well, once again, the church can, knows the numbers, they can report the numbers, and they don't. And so instead we get these estimations. I promise you 54% of the members of the church are not attending Sunday services every week. So the cell phone report was really interesting. I did actually read that. And it's an ingenious way to collect the data 
the one I read was 15 to 18 percent attendance. That is, yes, very shocking, but that probably is much closer to reality. And don't forget that the, we're really comparing apples to oranges with this entire comparison by comparing Latter-day Saints with peoples of other faiths. And the reason for that is, is because when you ask in the United States, are you a Latter-day Saint? The number that actually affiliate themselves with the church is so much lower than what is actually on the rolls. It's a big difference than other religions. They don't have that separation. When you ask someone if they're a Baptist, if they say no, or if they say yes, they're not just on some Baptist church rolls and they didn't even really realize it. So when you ask Latter-day Saints and they say, yes, I'm going to church, and it turns out that that number is really small, you're not even taking into consideration the 70 or 80% of the people who are on the church's rolls, who the church considers to be Latter-day Saints, who would say, of course I don't go to church. So the number, not 50%, it is much, much lower to begin with and then when you use the cell phone data it is very very small this seems to be to confirm what i have nicknamed and others have nicknamed the mormon shrivel the church is in a lot of trouble and even though it touts articles like this on deseret news saying look 54 percent of us go to church that's tops that's not the entire story there is so much beneath it and without transparency we don't have the true picture the Mormon attendance is the same problem as the Mormon finances, is the same problem as the Mormon history and the Mormon doctrines. They just will not be transparent. So, I mean, this is the theme of this new show this week. When you're not transparent and you're, you're able to guide the narrative in any way you want, it doesn't have to be honest. It's not good. It's not true. It's just the narrative that will progress your agenda. So... Just be honest and release the data. I guarantee it's not 50%. 15% is probably accurate. Especially considering how many people are still on the church's rolls who never yeah. or almost never go to church. It could be even lower. You know, we had the leaked data from the UK, which was by congregation, by week, that was released, I think, for a period of approximately 10 years from I think it was about 2005 to 2015, where it showed that church attendance rates in the UK are around 11%. I would imagine that that is probably somewhat similar to what it is in the United States. Now, a couple of other uh, articles to get us through this uh, particular week here. And John, I really came to know you, um, you know, sorry, I don't follow your scholarly circles. I'm not an academic anymore, I guess, like you are. But I think a lot of people got to know you by your groundbreaking videos on the Mormonish channel, which talks about dismantling the Book of Mormon's authenticity. It was a five-part series. I did watch all five parts of that. Absolutely fascinating. You did an incredible job there. I would highly recommend anyone to go back and watch that. And the reason that I bring that up is because, you know, I'm sure that you're following this, John, that the church has released a new docuseries exploring evidence for the Book of Mormon. Are you following this? And uh, what's your reaction to Hannah Syriac's article here on March 24th, 2024? Yeah, it's a production by Scripture Central. They've released two episodes. I have watched both episodes. The um, marvelous work, the greatness of the evidence is the name of it. And they're, they're there to show archaeological, cultural, linguistic, and textual evidences for the Book of Mormon, as well as spiritual testimonies for the Book of Mormon. Uh, you know, episode one, they showed a sunken city, Samabak, uh, and compared it to the sunken cities in Third Nephi. Unfortunately, it's two and a half, almost three centuries out of date to qualify for that. They showed horse bones from disarticulated strata that to try to show authentic, archaeological paleontological authenticity for the book of mormon completely errant that you know they showed the nahum it's nahem meaning stone cutter or stone mason in the sabian script the inscription in yemen bizarrely the show is just running around saying well the book of mormon could take place in bolivia south america in mexico guatemala central america in tennessee north america and it shows you that the entire work is largely just ruminations on Mormon folklore. You cannot uh, pick the entire Western Hemisphere and say the Book of Mormon happened here. You need a location. And there is no archaeological evidence that can give you a location. And there is no linguistic, anthropological, or DNA evidence that can give you a location. And the reason there is none is because it didn't happen. So, and that's provable. You know, the truth will set you free. If the if Scripture Central came out and did a show 
the greatness of the spiritual witness. And everyone sat around a campfire and told their testimonies of the Book of Mormon. I'd understand that. But you purport to be scholarly. No registered uh, archaeologists I have yet to see on the show. <laughs> they have researchers uh, sharing largely what is Mormon folklore in order to make this debate. And it's interspersed with devotional and spiritual witnesses of the Book of Mormon. It's good Sunday school. It's terrible scholarship. Now, I know that you already reviewed the first one of those videos on A Marvelous Work and a Blunder, Mormonism Live 164. Are you going to continue to review the remaining videos along with it? Or what are you going to do, John? Well, well, that's, you know, if Bill and RFM asked me to to be on their show, I'd, I'd be happy to. I actually watched the last episode with uh, Rebecca Bibliotheca and Landon Brophy. You know, they had a horticulturalist from Spain on talking about Jacob 5, where he contradicted what the Book of Mormon text says. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did watch you, that. You just, can't, you just can't make it up. You know, I again, just that. tell the truth. That's all you have to do. Just tell the truth. And where the truth has deviated from the narrative you've told the members, repent. The archaeological foundation of the Book of Mormon in the New World is completely unknown, and that's to put it mildly. And therefore, we're flying all over. We're going to Bolivia. We're going to the Mayans. We're going to the Olmecs. We're going to the Incas. We're going through space and time through three millennia across a huge geography of North, Central, and South America attempting to paint bullseyes on the side of pyramids and ziggurats and then saying, look, here's the bullseye. We found it. We know that the Book of Mormon geography is internally, the internal consistency of the Book of Mormon geography is actually really, really good. It's one of the biggest bright spots in my mind for the Book of Mormon. We know that it is a limited geography of no more than, I believe it's 500 miles in length and maybe only uh, 100 miles wide. It's something along the, uh, do I have that about right? It's yeah, 300 square miles or so, the Sorensen model. Right. Uh, the Book of Mormon is not historical. There's 0% chance that it's historical. The shadow side of going around the world and trying to find the Book of Mormon is you taking the indigenous traditions and peoples of all the locations that you're going to, and you're saying, oh, you descended from Book of Mormon times. You descended from Lamanites and Nephites, and that isn't true. This kind of methodology has consequences if you are going to paint the Lamanites in Tennessee and Guatemala and Peru, then what about the indigenous people of Tennessee, Guatemala, and Peru? What are you saying about their history, their heritage, their ancestors? You have to be very careful when you make this journey. And so as a result, you are duty bound, you are morally bound to prove the historicity of the Book of Mormon in a location. And they can't and they never will be able to because you can't. So the argument has to change into something completely other. And that's not what that show is about. Well, half of the show is about that. The half of the show is they say, well, we may not be able to tell you exactly when or exactly where, but you can always pray about it. That's why at the end of Scripture Central, we get the testimony time, which is not what I was hoping for, with an updated, supposedly, how great the evidence is. When I'm talking about evidence, I want something that is withstands scientific scrutiny, that has an objective way to be verified, not saying a prayer to a supernatural deity. So I'm a bit disappointed at Scripture Central. I'm not sure what I was hoping for, but it definitely hasn't delivered so far. But John, I am definitely going to be watching the remainder of the episodes because I definitely look forward to this type of thing. And I know it's not necessarily something we cover in the Mormon News Roundup, but it is very interesting to me. And I hope to see you back on Mormonism Live and also on the Mormonish Podcasting using your expertise to tell us more about the fact-checking that goes behind the Scripture Central. Me too. <laughs> you bet. Now, we have two last articles to take us out of here, and the, this one is uh, going pretty viral here, and it's David Archuleta. John, you identified yourself earlier on our podcast as an ex-Mormon. Well, David Archuleta, for I believe the first time, has now joined you in the ex-Mormon community, and he did so in a very public way by posting a TikTok. Let me play that for you. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I'm experiencing things as an adult that most people experienced in junior high and high school. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course, I'm a lightweight when it comes to drinking alcohol. <laughs> I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course, one cup of coffee makes my body freak out and gives me the jitters. <laughs> I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course, I was a 30-year-old virgin. <laughs> I was. 
I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course it feels freeing to be able to wear tank tops again. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I felt naked not wearing garments for the first six months of not wearing them. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I'm catching up on all the swear words like <laughs> I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I hid while I went to the Book of Mormon musical because I was afraid of anyone seeing me cease watch something that was inappropriate. I'm an ex-Mormon. Of course I'm going to write a song about how hard it is to walk away from your faith when you believed all your life that it was the absolute truth. That was the deciding factor of every decision you made. And it's called Hell Together. And it's coming out March 20th, by the way. Oh, we're gonna hell together. So, John, it seems like you can really relate to David Archuleta's journey, at least in part. Huh. I hadn't seen that before. That was that was hilarious and true. <laughs> it's true. It's hilarious because it's true. I have never understood how a person can be gay and Mormon or in the LGBTQ community and Mormon. And I'm grateful that David has found his journey wherever that leads him. And yeah, it's funny in the message there that he said he was a virgin until he was 30. Wait a minute. Am I, am I reading too much between the lines there was, whoa, <laughs> it looks like he's uh, really getting out there and it's taken him a long time to really come to grips with who he is because he's had to do it in such a public way. He's been constantly scrutinized, not only by the members in his own congregation, but his own family members, his fans, the public at large, since he's such a public figure, he has said a long time ago that he was stepping away from the church, but he never never identified to my knowledge of being an actual ex-Mormon until now. And, you know, he used to be, John, the poster child for who was a gay Mormon. You know, he was singing with the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. He was on a mission and they were sending documentary fil uh, film crews out there with him to document all the success on his mission. He used to sell his talks in Deseret Book or his music in the church, uh, in the BYU bookstore. He used to be the shining example of the only 3% of Latter-day Saints who affiliate themselves as part of the LGBTQ community. I mean, heck, he even sung at Sister Ballard's funeral. He used to be the greatest Mormon of all time. But as soon as he stepped away and signaled that he was no longer a part of the church, all of that came crumbling down. And it seems like now he's really embraced his new identity. And he said that it took him months or years to do so. It's been a long and painful process. And I wish we could play his new song, which is called Hell Together. But that's an incredibly powerful anthem. And for those people who have left high demand religions like the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it resonates. It is beautiful. It is heartfelt. And it is really amazing. Good for him. I'm glad that he is finding what works for him and I and whatever and what works for him what is what works for him. I really liked what Cultural Hall had to say. I don't know if you're going to talk about that, but he made a comment because there was a lot of negative comments on David Archuleta after he left and Cultural Hall said, "You want to know the difference between me and the Mormon holes ripping on David Archuleta for his I am an ex-Mormon video? If David ever decides to leave ex-Mormonism and return to the church, I won't say one Thing about him, I will wish him well. Is this perfectly said? That's my feelings. Wherever David needs to be, there's a lot of dynamics in that life lifetime. You know, being a poster child, a gay Mormon, the trauma that is the result of that, because there's a lot of contradiction and paradox in that that is unhealthy. He's had to walk through it. It continues to walk through it. Will continue to walk through it. Wherever he lands up, I'm going to support David Archuleta. Come or stay. If he if he returned to the church, that would surprise me. But I'm like, you know, if, if that's your path of healing, so be it. Yeah, David Archuleta, you do you. And if you find happiness being an ex-Mormon, I wish you the very best. If you return to the church, then I similarly wish you absolutely no Amen. ill will. And I hope that you find, especially considering your troubled history of the agony that you've gone through have been having been raised gay in one of the most homophobic organizations in the world you know i had a brother who was gay who was raised in the church and the trauma and the damage that that did to him for his entire life he is still trying to unravel at this time so the fact that david came through and that he's still holding his head high i wish him the very best but there's a big difference out there in the twitter sphere for 
true believing members who want to now take shots at David Archuleta. And I do find that to be very remarkable because as you pointed out what Kulch said, if David comes back to the church, that doesn't mean anything to me really at all. I wouldn't have anything negative to say, but that's not the case for people who really, if you leave the church, you have to be demonized. And that's where you get takes like this. Quote, if you're looking for a perfect example of an overrated musician, you can reference the dude below, meaning David Archuleta. It's not his fault Latter-day Saints always loved and supported their own. He's just some ungrateful fellow. Here, I'm sending love to an ex-Mormon. David, you're overrated. No offense. Because people's identity is wrapped up in whether they're a Mormon or not. That means whether they're a good person or not. That means whether I can enjoy their music or not. For me, those things are totally separate. I agree. Totally separate. And here's another take that I found out there on Twitter as well. It was from uh, Guy Incognito, which has blocked me on X, by the way. And he's preemptively blocked David Archuleta. I have no desire to see his mocking of my brethren. Exmos like that insult members and non-members, and I have more important things to be concerned about. So even though David Archuleta never mocked anyone, he said, I'm an ex-Mormon. He didn't bash the church. He didn't say, I don't believe in it. He just said, I'm not part of the church anymore. Well, that's considered mocking. That's considered rude. And therefore, he has to be demonized. And you know, it's just it, it's all too common on the Twitter sphere is what I've seen this week. His song is going to hell together. It's a beautiful song framed in a certain kind of twisted context. A Mormon heaven is its own hell. So so leaving that space is, well, it's all a journey through hell. It's just where you end up. So... <laughs> <laughs> Our last article here, John, is in Las Vegas here. The church is trying to build a second temple in Las Vegas, which is causing a great deal of controversy. Once again, we've seen this happen time and time again, where the church is building controversial structures in places that are causing a lot of angst among the local population because the state of Nevada is only about 2% Mormon. And I believe that Las Vegas is even less than that. And I want to play this clip here that talks about what the church is trying to do with its new Lone Mountain Temple. And you're going to see that the locals there are, many of them are not in favor of this move. And I want to get your take on it to see if this is religious bigotry or what the circumstance is surrounding this temple. For the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is causing some in the Lone Mountain community to worry a large building will end the rural nature of their neighborhood. That temple will be located on Grand Canyon near Alexander. 8 News Now reporter James Schaefer spoke with neighbors and the LDS area president about this proposed site. The neighborhood association there tells me they have no problem with the LDS community. It's simply the size of the building. An LDS spokesperson for the area is saying they represent more than 3,000 neighbors that want it, but a document could stop it before construction even begins. If they were to abide by the interlocal agreement, I'm sure we could probably deal with that, but not a Taj Mahal. They're worried it's just too big. The Northwest Preservation Association, a community of neighbors living in the Lone Mountain area, saying they are concerned about the footprint, traffic, and light pollution of this proposed LDS Temple. We're talking about something that's going to look like a three-story office building that's going to be lit up 24-7 with a 230-foot uh, tall spire. All they need to do is follow the law and what we have to do to live here. We can only have 35 feet high structures, you know. Um, <laughs> that's 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 the answer is just comply with the law i don't want this to be taken as a, an affront against their their beliefs because it's not that at all it's the building i've raised my kids in this area i love this area and i think that the members of the rural preservation group do great work bud stoddard lds state president for the lone mountain ward says he understands as he lives in the community too but he adds that the three thousand church members living in that area are excited about how close it is. It's become more difficult for members such as myself who live all the way on the west side of town out by Lone Mountain to make it over to Sunrise Mountain to be able to go to the temple regularly. So why this location? This is a beautiful area. The temple is going to be a beautiful project and this is an opportunity for us uh, to be able to have a temple close to our people. Now, that document law, which was mentioned, is the Interlocal Land Agreement, an agreement signed between the city and the state signed sometime in the 1980s, meant to preserve the rural nature of the area. Either way, both groups tell me they want what's best for the community. Denise?
footnote here, Las Vegas Councilwoman, uh, Councilwoman Alan Polensky, who represents that area, sent us a statement saying, I strongly believe in being engaged in the comments and feedback from area residents. The first phase of that project will start with the Planning Commission, where there will be invited to City Hall to make comments, and that's coming up April 9th of this year. John, that 35-minute commute is a real doozy. <laughs> People forget that originally uh, your temple endowment was a once in a lifetime thing. You were to get it. It is like the Hajj. You, you go on pilgrimage at least once in your lifetime to receive your endowment uh, for the next world. That slowly morphed into, let's emphasize work on the dead. So repeat visits to the temple. And now it seems to be a financial anchor point where you build a temple and that will generate so much revenue in the area. <laughs> Look, uh, they keep doing this. Uh, Mormonish uh, podcast has really done an excellent series. Cody, Wyoming, Heber, Utah, now in Las Vegas. They keep doing the exact same thing, walking in, buying real estate, building a temple. They have to change all the ordinances and laws in order to build that temple. And they just ram road it over the local city council. Or very often, actually, they fill the local city council with apologetic attendees. In this case, People are getting paid thousands of dollars in their political campaigns by the law firm representing the church in order to change the ordinances, in order to build the temple. And you can see all these communities have risen up and saying, you know, we don't want to offend the Mormons, but we this is wrong. We didn't agree to this and we don't want this monstrosity of a building in our rural neighborhood. The church has a playbook. If we could just look at all the money going in and out and all the relationships that are being greased in that playbook, you know, the church would stop doing it. Once again, transparency would help. But until then, we're, how many of these stories are we going to see? Apparently, we're going to be seeing them more and more, considering that President Nelson is announcing an average of 15 to 20 temples per general conference every single general conference. And these are typically $50 million buildings. And they're going in, in this case, as you mentioned, in Cody and in Heber and here in Lone Mountain. And I have a brother who lives right by this, by the way, who's not a member of the church anymore. But you know, it's causing a huge amount of controversy because, as you mentioned, it looks like the, the wheels need to be greased on this from the church's law firm being paid to the political donations to the council persons who are involved with this. The church really knows every tactic in the book to try to push these things over, whether it's appealing to federal law, whether it's suing the city council, whether it's uh, telling them that if you try to fight this, we're going to continue to sue you in perpetuity. We're going to bankrupt your small little unincorporated towns here of Lone Mountain or what other, uh, other planning commissions or city councils be prepared to wrestle against one of the most well-funded organizations in the United States who is very patient on these things. The biggest issue, as the Mormonish podcast pointed out, is the fact that the church doesn't go into these communities and say, hey, we have felt that we want to build a temple in your community. Let's talk about it. How can we best do this to fulfill your needs and our needs? It's never a negotiation. It's always done by fiat. And as we've seen in the Lone Mountain Temple, from potentially underhanded methodologies, this is a troubling pattern that the church continues to engage in, in ramming these giant structures down the throats of mostly non-member communities, and it's not going to win a lot of friends and influence people, that's for sure. Uh, it's the same playbook happening in multiple states. It's bizarre to me because they are burning all the bridges for the non-Mormon community. That's not what you want to do. So what is the thinking behind it? They've got ranks of people who have thought very hard and, and they think this is worth it. So it makes me wonder what's the end goal of it. Well, what is the thinking indeed? Because but what I've heard from, I have a friend who also works on the temple planning commissions that go out and find these sites for the church to build temples on. And what they typically do is several years before the church is going to be building a temple, they have potential sites that they're going to be thinking about, and they will bring parcels of land back to church headquarters and say, if you want a temple in this location, here's five plots of land that we could potentially either own now or potentially either acquire 
fire. And President Nelson himself supposedly prays over these plots of land. That's why once a site of land is selected, it that becomes a divine mandate. It's basically like divine command theory. We have to go with that particular plot of land, no matter what the consequences are, no matter how many people we upset, because that's a plot of land that God wanted us to build the temple on. And that creates huge upheavals in the community and among members of the church themselves. I'm actually surprised that the stake president was willing to go on camera because typically these things are mostly indefensible and burn a lot of bridges. It's another troubling case of Goliath trying to uh, push down David in a small community. Any last thoughts here on the uh, temple here in Lone Mountain, John? Why is it that uh, the morally reckless tends to be underwritten by the religious righteous? <laughs> Just think about this as well, John. Part of your donations that you give to the church is for erecting these uh, very large structures. But also some of it is going to be going to sue these small city councils and these planning zone commissions and these protect our neighborhood organizations that are associated with it. So part of your donation is going to be to make sure that you litigate these temples in and push them through no matter the human cost or the cost of the city or the church's reputation or anything else. And that really got me thinking that, you know what? We really shouldn't put another temple in the Lone Mountain area, which is where my brother lives. And occasionally I go to visit. It is a very nice area. It's very peaceful. And it is not at all designed for such a large structure like that. There's plenty of places in Vegas that are perfectly fine to be lit up 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and can handle lots of parking and lots of traffic. And that brings me to our Mormon News Roundup poll of the week, John. And what is the poll of the week this time? Top 10 reasons that the new LDS Las Vegas temple should go on the strip. <laughs> Absolutely, John. Right on the strip. I think it would fit in right in there. And we're going to show you why. We release new episodes of the Mormon News Roundup every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you come on over to YouTube at that time, you can interact with your humble host in the chat. And I've got 10 options as to why the temple should, instead of going into Lone Mountain, go onto the strip itself. And what's example number one, John? Number one. You'll probably make more money playing slots than paying tithing. <laughs> that could be true. That could be true. You know, you lose money playing slots, but you can occasionally win playing slots too. If you get lucky, I don't know about tithing though. I think it's Tem a negative uh, investment in tithing. T temple attendance would increase. People would just be going in there and play the slots. Absolutely. I, I love this picture. That is That sums it all up for me. Or how about number two? Number two, what happens in the temple stays in the temple. <laughs> well, it was supposed to until we had new name Noah, but now what happens in the temple is pretty much well known to everybody, isn't it? Well, you know, on the strip, it could, you know, there could be variety. Ah, nice. Yeah. And what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. It seems like two peas in a pod there. Or That's how about number right. three? Las Vegas has a violent past just like Mormons. I, again, we're seeing a lot of similarities here. You know, we had the Mountain Meadow Massacre. We had the Bear River Massacre. We've had the, 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 the Oaths of Vengeance. We've had a lot of blood oaths in the temple. This all conforms with the, the mafioso vibe of the Las Vegas Strip, in my opinion. That's right. The uh, Mafia Syndicate should be right next to the uh, Mormon Syndicate in temple form. <laughs> yeah, they have a lot in common. How, how about number four? Number four, in casinos, all the money goes to the top. Boy, that seems appropriate. <laughs> yeah, very little of your donation is actually kept at the local level. A lot of it just goes right back to Salt Lake City to do who knows what, actually. But that has a lot in common with those Vegas casinos. You know, the rich magnets on the top, those are the ones who are getting all of the dough, from my understanding. Or how about number five? Mormon Inc., just like Vegas resorts, have a history of flouting the laws. You don't say, John. Boy, you don't say. <laughs> You had the Edmunds Tucker Act. You had the SEC fine. You know, it just seems like, once again, two peas in a pod. Uh, how about number six? The church can tout the power and authority of women with its neon sign, girls, girls, girls. You know, John, no other religious institution that I'm aware of gives more power and authority to women in the entire world. I, I seem to remember hearing that someplace. I agree. Just think an angel Moroni on the strip with girls, girls, girls right underneath it. Again, that would bring in a lot of traffic. Look, if Joseph Smith were still around, I guarantee that this would be very close to what we would have right now. This would be very similar. I think or this is the origin. 
Yeah, exactly. How about number, number seven? Number seven. Technically, it's not money exchanging in the temple because they are poker chips. <laughs> yeah, Jesus said you're not supposed to exchange money in the temple, and he up up upended all of the tables. He used the whip, and he got those guys out of there. That's evil. But if you pay for your baptistry clothes in poker chips, no, totally issue. different. Yeah, no totally problem. Totally different. <laughs> no problem at all. No issues. Or how about number eight? Literally, Elvis can marry you. Oh, come on, that's awesome. <laughs> you know they all wear white jumpsuits you know in the yeah. temple you wear the white jumpsuits they fit right in absolutely in fact you can you can even see donny osmond in a show then come over to the temple and have him seal you for time and all eternity either way it's a win-win how about number nine temple clothing finally gets the rhinestones they deserve <laughs> hey that is a great picture i would wear that jacket that is a nice that is a hot pick john for sure or uh, how about number 10 Weird outfits in Las Vegas go hand in hand. You know, I hear they wear some weird outfits in the temple. I'm not too sure about that. But if they do, I think that they're going to fit right in, John. Uh, I agree. <laughs> and that does take us to our Mormon News Roundup poll of the week, which is the top 10 reasons that the new LDS Las Vegas temple should go on the strip. And John, will you be the first person to take our poll? I'd be very grateful for that. I think I have to go with the rhinestones. I want the jacket. <laughs> That is a hot jacket for sure. We, we really appreciate that. Uh, that does take us to our final segment, John, which is the Mormon News Roundup Joke of the Week, and you can take us out on this. Sure. Why did the Mormon prophet cross the road? Uh, I don't know. He just wanted the money. Uh, it makes a lot of sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Now, uh, John, what projects are you working on? How can people get in touch with you? Um, inquiring minds want to know. Yeah, I'm uh, actually in the middle of writing a book on uh, rock art. I uh, just finished a tour in the Yucatan, probably will be doing another one. And uh, they can get a hold of me. Actually, I, my website, my personal website is down for remodeling. So they'll have to contact uh, Mormon Issue U to get a hold of me, I guess. <laughs> well, we'll look forward to when that website goes back up. I really want to thank you, John, for coming on the Mormon News Roundup. If you feel like making a donation to the Mormon News Roundup, you can do so to our Patreon. We'd be very grateful for that. There's new Mormon News Roundup episodes every Sunday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And there's also new episodes of the Mormon Movie Reviews every Monday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And this Monday, we're doing a watch party for that famous 2002 classic by Jack Whalen, Charlie starring Heather De Beers. You ever watch this one, John? That was decades ago. <laughs> this is a fun, fun movie. It has an insane twist at the end of it that I'm not going to spoil for you, but we are going to be doing that tomorrow night. Please like and subscribe and turn on notifications to the Mormon News Roundup. A shout out to Weird Alma on Bandcamp.com for this episode's music. And thanks so much, John, for ruminating with me on the great and spacious Beehive. And remember, remember, no unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. When it comes to nicknames of the church, such as LDS Church, the Mormon Church, to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's Church is a major victory for Satan. 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 Satan.